Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here with a video on cellular energy. Now this video is going to be a very broad overview and we'll have separate videos that will go into uh, energetics in much more detail, specifically some detailed processes. But for this, I just want to talk broadly about sort of, you know, why do organisms need energy and how does that tie into their roles within ecosystems and then broadly, what is that energy used for? So with that as the background, we're going to start with a short pause and think. And so what I want you to do is pause and think and say, how does this plant capture energy? And then what does it do with the captured energy? It's a fairly simple question, but it gets at the root of a lot of what we're going to be talking about. So take a moment and pause and think. All right. So hopefully you came up with the idea that this is a plant and it is a producer or autotroph, which means that it captures energy sunlight and then utilizes the energy from sunlight to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates and other organic molecules. So it's able to build and store chemical energy in organic molecules by converting light energy into that stored chemical energy. Once it has that stored chemical energy, it can use those structures to actually build additional tissues. So we know that cellulose is a polymer that is made up of many glucose molecules. So since photosynthesis makes glucose, so the glucose molecules derived from photosynthesis could then be put together in order to make physical structures. So one of the things that we'll use the energy for is to combine organic molecules to store tissues. Now, plants also undergo cell respiration. So these plants will also undergo the process of taking those glucose molecules and breaking, down, breaking them down and making ATP, and then using that ATP on the cellular level to power the activities. Again, growth is a big one, and then all of the metabolic activities of the cell, uh, anytime that it will be breaking anything down or building something up, those will all be things that are energetically requiring ATP to be used. And then ultimately, it's going to be using those to undergo functions that will allow this organism to survive and reproduce and hopefully pass its genes on to the next generation, which is ultimately the evolutionary goal of all species. All right. So that was sort of a very philosophical way of getting to the final answer. So let's look at some specific examples of how cellular energy manifests itself within how an organism fits into broader ecosystems. So the main role of energy in living organisms is to power, again, the growth and the ability to survive and reproduce. And so we broadly group organisms that can utilize sunlight or, in some cases, other sources of energy in order to convert inorganic molecules of carbon dioxide and water into organic molecules. And then we can break those organic molecules down to release the stored energy that is found in those. And so we often refer to organisms that can make their own organic molecules through the process of photosynthesis. And we refer to those as autotrophs. And so plants and algae will definitely fit in there. And many bacterial will fit into that category. And then anything that cannot make its own energy, we refer to as a heterotroph. In, or, in other words, these are things that need to consume organic molecules that were produced by other organisms in order to get access to those en the energy. And so all animals fit into this category. Uh, fungi fit in this category. And then many bacteria will also fit into that category as well. So how does then this fit into the uh, living system of, say, an ecosystem? And so all living systems require the constant input of energy. If we did not have an input of energy into an ecosystem, everything would eventually break down. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But what we know is that the ultimate source of energy for living systems is going to be the sun. There are a few exceptions to this. So there are things like hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean and some other things. But in the vast majority of the ecosystems that we're going to look at, we're going to be talking about the sun as the ultimate source of energy for the vast majority of ecosystems. That sun energy is then going to go to producers. Those producers are then going to be consumed by herbivores, by decomposers, and those herbivores are also going to be consumed by carnivores. We group the herbivores, carnivores, and decomposers into a bucket called 
heterotrophs. And the reason we group them all together like that is because none of those organisms can make their own energy and they are reliant upon herbivores to take the light energy from the sun and turn it into a form that can then actually enter into the ecosystem where the heterotrophs can have access to it. Now, the other thing to note about this is that this actually ties us back to the concept of thermodynamics. And so we say that life requires highly ordered systems and it does not violate the second law of thermodynamics. So it's really important to note that when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics this is the idea of entropy. And so without the input of energy, systems are going to give off energy and they're going to tend towards a case of disorder or as we refer to as entropy. Things have a tendency to head towards chaos or disorder. And so the energy input must exceed the energy lost in order to maintain order. And this is what we see in cellular processes. So the idea is that when you have an input of energy, say, for example, you take in energy in the form of food, you're going to as the matter of process of taking the energy out of that food, you are going to produce heat as a byproduct of those reactions. In other words, you will not have a 100% conversion of stored chemical energy into a form that can lead to work by a system. And so we know that the energy input has to be larger because it has to account for the fact that there's going to be some sort of loss as we work to maintain order and some heat's going to be given off. We also know, if we move on to the next bullet point, that cellular processes that release energy may be coupled with cellular processes that require energy. So in a lot of systems, what we'll find, and this is going to be key when we talk about ATP, there's what is referred to as energy coupling. So in a lot of biological processes, you will see that in order to build something, you are going to have to release energy from some other location. And so a classic example of this is in photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, the light energy comes in and in the light reactions, we're going to see that ATP and NADPH are going to be made. Any NADPH and ATP are high energy molecules. They're molecules where we had to put energy in to make these highly ordered molecules. And then we will break those highly ordered molecules down as we build up our simple sugars. And so it is the coupling of the breakdown of ATP with the formation of a carbohydrate that is an example of releasing energy and coupling that release of energy with building a more ordered structure. And the last thing is that the loss of order or energy results ultimately in death. So if we were not to continue to put energy in, let's say you take a plant, you do not allow it to have the input of energy, eventually it will run out of the energy to drive the formation of an order system. Similarly, if you have a living organism that's a heterotroph and you prevent the input of energy into that, eventually the, that system will break down and there will need to be an input of energy in order to maintain the ordered system. So without that input, we would ultimately have a complete inability to create order and that would result in death. And so on the bottom, what you see is you have the idea here that energy is going to come in from the sun. It's going to go into the biosphere. We call those hot photons because that is the idea of putting energy into a biosphere. The biosphere is then going to create ordered systems. But as a byproduct of all of the work in that biosphere, some energy is going to dissipate as heat. That heat is not going to be recaptured. And so that's going to be the heat that's going to dissipate out into the universe. And so we know for a fact that even though there's a lot of sun energy that hits the earth, only a small fraction of that is actually converted into energy that can do work in living systems. And some of that energy will ultimately dissipate out into the universe through the process of entropy. All right, so energy-related pathways in biological systems are sequential to allow for more controlled and efficient transfer of energy a product of a reaction in a metabolic pathway is generally the reactant of the subsequent step in a pathway. So one of the things to keep in mind is that when you see a metabolic pathway, and in this case, what I've done is I've brought up glycolysis. So glycolysis is the breaking of glucose down to form pyruvate. And what we're going to see here is that in each step of the process, as we move from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, we're going to see a process taking place. Now, 
the general flow of this is going to be from the most ordered molecule to a lower ordered molecule. And this is going to follow the process where you're going to see a drop of energy from highly ordered to less ordered to less ordered. Now, is that always going to happen? The answer is no. Sometimes there actually will have to be an input of energy. And we actually know that because you can see several points during this process where ATP is put in and that phosphorylation is going to take the molecule and it's going to energize it and it will give it a higher potential energy and that potential energy will allow this system to then proceed to the next step. And so what we often find is that as you look at systems where you have a metabolic pathway, you can immediately tell whether or not there's going to be um, a natural release of energy that's taking place or if the reaction itself is creating a more ordered molecule. Now, remember, you're always going to be giving off energy via heat through entropy through these processes. But by looking at a process like this, you can actually tell whether or not the product is requires a higher degree of energy than the reactant that went in. So, for example, we know that glucose 6-phosphate has higher potential energy. How do we know that? Well, what we've seen is that we took some ATP and we phosphorylated this molecule, creating a greater potential energy molecule because phosphorylated molecules are have higher potential energy, are a little less stable, and they have a greater capacity to do work. And so we can see energy-related pathways in these systems follow set pathways, and then the reactions will actually tell us what's going on related to the energy transfers. The other thing you should know is that we're not going to skip five or six steps. So you can't just take glucose and in one single step, convert it to a molecule of pyruvate. While that might seem like it would be a lot more efficient, the fact of the matter is, is that we control these steps through a, a series of enzymes, through a series of processes, and we do so for a couple of reasons. One, we can, by having additional steps, control the flow of energy and control the magnitude of energy that is going to dissipate as heat through these various steps. The other thing is, is that it provides us various off points. So, for example, there may be a product that is made as a byproduct of the system that could be used in some other way. And so by having this process, we can either have some branching out or we could have the ability to bring something in from a different pathway where maybe we, for example, have the ability to make something like a fructose 6-phosphate through a different metabolic process. Well, if we make that through some other process, then we can enter it into this process and then go through a controlled set of metabolic steps. All right. So a fairly complicated process. Hopefully uh, you got a lot out of it and we will do more details on energy in some upcoming videos. So I hope this was helpful and I will talk to you all soon.